Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I thought that the internet was going to be this new connective medium. But more recently, I've been wondering whether that's actually the case. I've been concerned that the internet may not be as connective as we thought. And the first place that I began to have an inkling that something weird was going on uh, was one morning when I uh, logged on to my Facebook page. I uh, had just on this morning gone to the trouble of seeking out friends who disagreed with me. I really wanted to get outside of my own sort of narrow parochial political point of view. I wanted to be hearing what people who had more conservative views were posting and uh, see what they were liking and uh, be talking to them on, on Facebook. And on this particular morning, I logged on and they weren't there. And it was strange. It was like Facebook was editing them out. It was like they had disappeared. And as a matter of fact, it was. Facebook was looking at which links I was clicking on. It was looking at who I was having conversations with and what I was liking. And it had noticed that I was clicking more on the links that I agreed with than on the links that I disagreed with. And as a result, it had edited them out and they disappeared. Facebook at this point uh, is kind of a big deal. It's a medium that uh, one in 11 human beings uh, now uses. An increasing proportion of people go there to find their news. 50% of uh, the traffic driven to many news websites now comes from Facebook. And if Facebook is subtly distorting what we see and what we don't see, that's going to make a big consequence for the 600 or 700 million people who use it on a daily basis. And so I began to wonder, you know, sort of why? Why is Facebook doing this? And as I began to learn more about it, why is this technology creeping? all across the web. And I think the best uh, place to start in answering that question uh, is a statistic that Eric Schmidt from Google likes to talk about. He says, if you start at the beginning of human history and you were to record every conversation, every book, every piece of art, and you were to track all of that data, it would be about five exabytes of data. That's about 8 million 80 gigabyte iPod touches. And the problem, says Eric Schmidt, is that that same amount of data poured online in the last two days. So there's this immense torrent of data that uh, we have to deal with. It's growing every day. It comes from our cell phones. It comes from our email. It comes from our status updates. And uh, a number of companies have realized that if you can provide a way to sort through that data and pull out the little bits of gold in this sort of, in the torrent, you can actually uh, make some good money. And so they began to investigate, well, how do you do that? What's the best mechanism for, for figuring out what actually matters to people? And the technique that they came up with at its most simple, um, we're all familiar with now from Amazon and from Netflix. It's, if you like this, you'll like that. And if you like this, you'll like that works in two basic ways. One is that it looks for people like you, people who seem to have some of the same preferences than, that you do, and uses that to project out what your other preferences might be. And it looks at sort of uh, groups of products or movies that group together. You know, how do these, uh, you know, which, which movies, if, if someone likes this movie, they'll also uh, tend to like that movie. The interesting thing about, uh, this is, you know, to do it, you have to, cre you have to uh, collect an enormous amount of data. The numbers are just kind of staggering. The top 50 websites now uh, each put an average of 67 cookies and tracking pieces of code on your computer every time that you visit. And that's so that they can collect this massive amount of data that's needed to crunch this. But the interesting thing is you don't necessarily need data on the topic you're trying to represent in order to make a guess about what someone might like. You can actually start to infer from seemingly unrelated data 
who someone is. And so, for example, if you know that uh, someone prefers milk uh, with their meal over wine, then you know that they're much more likely to be politically conservative. And if you know that they rarely frequent fast food outfits, you know that they're much more likely to be liberal. In this immense amount of data, we begin to reveal things that we never thought that we were revealing. We begin to be able to draw relationships between pieces of data that seem not to have much to do with each other. What's interesting about this is you don't need that much data in order to begin to be able to make these extrapolations. And while uh, five data points seem pretty crude, it's not a very good approximation of who you are, nonetheless, with just five data points, uh, the company Hunch says that they can predict your consumer preferences about 80% of the time correctly. In fact, even if they don't have your five data points, if they know that you're friends with two people and you have their five data points, then you can still predict their preferences correctly. In other words, it doesn't even necessarily matter how much data you give away about yourself. Your friends may be doing that work for you. And the company that has actually sort of gone the farthest with this kind of statistical technique is Google, the way that Google works as this idea uh, page rank. Page rank is sort of uh, getting the web to vote on which page is the most authoritative response to a query. But page rank is an increasingly small part of the Google algorithm. Increasingly, Google uses this personal data to give each of us a different view of Google search results. In fact, as of December 4th, 2009, there is no standard Google anymore. We each get different results based on what we've queried before, based on uh, what we've clicked on. So I actually asked a bunch of friends to Google Egypt and send me screenshots of what they got. Here's my friend Scott's screenshot, and here's my friend Daniel's screenshot. They're both white men, they're both around the same age, they have similar political views, they both live in New York, and yet when you put these two search results side by side, you don't even have to read the links to see how different these two views of the world are. But when you do put them side by side, the difference is really quite striking. Scott got all sorts of information about the crisis in Egypt, about the protests there, about what was going on politically. But Daniel didn't. In fact, nowhere on the first page of results was there anything about the political upheaval in Egypt. He just got information about going to see the pyramids. So we're drifting apart online. We're seeing different pictures of the world. And the reason is that there's sort of this obsession right now in Silicon Valley with this idea of relevance. Relevance is sort of the name for the solution to that information overload. And when they talk about relevance, they mean something very particular. Because these are companies that generally live or die on the basis of ad sales. And ad sales happen when people click more. And so relevance means the things that you click the most. Increasingly, we see different worlds online. Increasingly, the internet is showing us what it thinks we want to see, not necessarily the world as it is. Increasingly, we're sort of surrounded by this membrane of personalized filters. And the thing is that this sort of creates a filter bubble. It creates a, a personal universe of unique information uh, that makes it through all of these filters. Now, you don't necessarily choose what gets into your filter bubble. These algorithms are doing the work for you. And therefore, importantly, you don't really know what is outside of it. You don't really know what you're missing. So I want to talk about three problems uh, with living in, a, in the filter bubble world. The first is something I call the distortion problem. It's that when you don't know what the editorial viewpoint is through which you're viewing the world, it's very hard to see how distorted your view is. For the scientists in the room, it's kind of like you can't extrapolate from a small sample what the full set looks like. And as opposed to traditional media, where when you turn on uh, a politically slanted news broadcast or you pick up a magazine, you kind of have a sense of on what basis information is being edited in and edited out. Here you don't really have a sense. You don't know who Facebook or Google thinks you are. You don't know on what basis they're deciding to show you things. And therefore, you don't know what you might be missing. It's an unknown unknown. Stuff that's important, but not necessarily uh, sort of sexy or highly clickable, drops out of view. This is the like button. And the like button is the primary way that people transmit information across Facebook. It's very heavily weighted in the algorithm that Facebook uses to decide what to show you 
and what not to show you. And the like button has a very particular valence. It's not a neutral word, like. It's a positive word. And so it's easy to click like on I ran a marathon, but it's hard to click like on a woman about to be stoned to death in Iran. And so certain kinds of information can travel very quickly on Facebook, and other kinds of information drop out of sight entirely. The second problem is what the anthropologist Dana Boyd called the psychological equivalent of obesity. And the people who sort of uh, did some of the great research in this area um, were looking at uh, the movie rental website Netflix. They were looking at why certain movies uh, move faster through the Netflix queue than others. They noticed that movies like Iron Man just sort of zip right through the queue. They get added to the list of movies you want to watch, and almost immediately they're at your house, you're watching them. And other movies, like Waiting for Superman, the sort of education documentary, can just spend a long time dawdling around waiting to get out to your home. So what's going on here? There are two very distinct clusters of movies that emerge. You have your want movies at the short end, the movies where you come home after a long day and you just want to turn something on and be entertained. And you can probably guess what the categories of the movies are <laughs> that are at the other end of the spectrum, right? This is uh, documentary films, Holocaust movies, and almost all of French cinema. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what they realized uh, was that there was sort of a, an interesting uh, internal tug of war here going on between two selves, between a sort of more compulsive, more immediate present self and a more aspirational future self. What the filter bubble tends to do is to uh, sort of push that balance in one direction. The traditional media give us a balance. You get some Justin Bieber and some Afghanistan. You get some information vegetables and some information dessert. But because the filter bubble is just focused on what are you going to click most, what are you going to click next, there are very different dynamics at play. And instead of getting a balanced information diet, you can find yourself surrounded by information junk food. In fact, you can live in a world in which information junk food appears to be the only thing that exists. And the final issue is a matter of control, because uh, that's really what's at stake here, that uh, when these uh, algorithms are cranked all the way up, they limit what we believe to be the options, what we believe to be the different points of view, and thus they limit what we choose. They limit our sense of freedom. When I'm Googling my dentist's phone number, I'm trying to remember what the capital of Switzerland is, it makes sense uh, to have one result. But it doesn't make sense when you're Googling Obama or climate change. Then you want a bigger view of the world. So what this all suggested to me is that I had my idea of the internet a little bit wrong. You know, I had sort of bought this, this mythology that said that uh, in the, you know, sort of 20th century society, uh, information flows were guarded by gatekeepers. These were the editors and the producers. And because there was a limited ability to get information out, of the, out to the public, they got to choose what people saw and didn't see. And that was a problem because they were often elites. They often had their own parochial interests. Um, it meant that the public only saw what they wanted them to see. And so it was a great thing when the internet swept them out of the way. All of a sudden, everyone could talk to everyone. Uh, there was this great decentralization and a sort of new democratized society emerged. Mm -hmm. But that's not really what's going on. It's not the case that we live in a gatekeeperless society now. There's a new set of gatekeepers, and they're not people, they're code. And the thing is that the code does many of the same things that those 20th century gatekeepers did. It decides what we see and we don't see. It makes priority decisions about which pieces of information are important. But it doesn't have the sense of embedded ethics that at their best the 20th century gatekeepers did. It's worth noting that uh, we've sort of been here before. It's not like newspapers uh, in the 1800s had any sense of civic responsibility either. They just put on the front page whatever would sell the most copies. But around uh, the end of World War I, there was this shift that occurred. And people began to realize that really you couldn't have a functioning democracy if you didn't have uh, informed citizens that knew about what uh, the, the topics they had to make choices on and that these newspapers were right at the center of that equation, that they had a responsibility 
to make sure that citizens had good information on which to base their decisions. And that's where journalistic ethics came from. And I think on the web, we're sort of back in 1921. And we need these new institutions to recognize their responsibility here and to step up as uh, not just commercial institutions, but really critical parts of a functioning democracy. We need to, them to give us more control so that we can decide when these filters are at work and when they're not. We need to give them, them to give us transparency so that we can see how this is all working, what results are personalized and on what basis. And we need to make sure that they have these sort of ethics embedded in. Maybe next to the like button on Facebook, there should be an important button that allows people to send that signal to their friends. Because I think we really actually need the internet to be that thing that connects us to new ideas and to new people and to new ways of thinking. And we need it not just because it makes life a more satisfying endeavor, but because actually I don't think we can solve many of the big problems that are in front of us in any other way. You know, if you think about poverty or you think about climate change or you think about uh, terrorism, these are not problems that can be solved by someone sitting in a room somewhere. They're problems that require uh, solutions that bring people together across vast differences from, va from different disciplines and different continents, thinking in different ways and talking to each other and convincing each other about a common solution. And I don't think that that can happen if we're all stuck in a web of one. You mentioned that the code, that the computer has no ethic. It doesn't have a sense of embedded ethics that previous gatekeepers had, whether yep. they were, you know, whether they were editors or whether they were agents or, or whomever. Um, but those people who were creating the code themselves have an ethic. And I was wondering if you could explore maybe the, uh, that ethic and how it may have evolved, how it may have changed from the early days of the web when we did have this, this openness and the potential to reach out and touch lots and lots of information to now where the code that's blocking us from all of that information is about personalization, about relevance. What's changed yeah. there? To be clear, I'm not saying that the code has no embedded ethics. It says that, uh, I'm saying that you know, it's, it doesn't have a sort of civic-minded ethics in it. Um, I had this argument with uh, someone at Google where I said, so how do you think ethically about your, sort of your editorial or curatorial responsibilities as you're uh, making these personalization decisions? And he said, oh, no, 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 there's no ethics here. It's just about giving people what they want. Uh, and I said, well, okay, but if I'm a 9-11 conspiracy theorist and I Google 9-11, is it your job to give me the conspiracy website that I'm most likely to click on? Or is it your job to actually give me you know, the popular mechanics article that debunks that? Which one is relevant? Which one is what I really want or really need? Initially, I think, um, because the internet was sort of this fringe phenomenon that really no one could quite figure out what it was or what, how to make money on it, um, there was this real ethos of kind of openness and connectedness that anyone, you know, that it was sort of a pure meritocracy in some sense where any idea could move and, and get a massive adoption. And I think essentially what's happened is that, uh, you know, as people have figured out how to make really large amounts of money online, um, that sort of commercial mentality has, has seeped in. And so when I was arguing about this with Facebook, I was talking to an engineer there, and he said, well, you know, let me just be blunt. What you want us to do is think about all of these complicated and important uh, problems and social issues and whatever. What we want to do is sit in a room and think up clever ways of making people spend more minutes per day on Facebook. And that's, I think, sort of one of the, one of the disconnects. What's interesting there is this conflict, this juxtaposition between the technologically driven solutions and the human beings who are actually interacting online. I mean, ultimately, what this, this notion of the, the Web 2.0 phenomenon, the social media phenomenon, which has been represented by things like Facebook and, and blogs and those types of opinion networks, the friend networks, the, the social graph, as some people have described it, yeah. um, that's, that's us as social beings. And so in many ways, it's as if this notion of creating technological solutions um, becomes a, um, a depersonalization of us as, as human beings. And it, it seems to have, have worked quite well for things like Facebook and, and yeah. for things like blogs. So At why should the, they change? Well, uh, you know, I do think in order to do personalization well, and to be clear, that's sort of more what I think needs to happen than 
just to sort of roll back time and go a different way. I think, you know, somehow people will want to use these filters, but they'll want to actually, you know, use these tools rather than having the tools use them. And the question is, how do you do that? When it comes to why these companies would have an interest in this, you know, I think if you look at the way that Facebook is starting to lose interest in some countries, you know, there's this first downtick of, uh, of use in Facebook since it really started. I wonder whether that's because it's sort of over-optimized, over-personalized, so that on any given day, the content appears sort of compulsively compelling, you know, but when you look back on a year of Facebook use, it's very hard to say, well, what value did I actually get out of that? It, did it add any meaning or learning to my life? Actually, what might be in Facebook's interest or Google's interest is in the long run to provide sort of people with a sense, not just that they're getting sort of what's most clickable, but they're actually discovering and learning things there. The, the real trend is data-driven development. So taking as much information as it can um, from you and then creating this relevance, creating this personalization. Now what's interesting though is that as you, you made the quote, um, or you, you referenced the quote from Eric Schmidt, you know, Google wants to give you what you don't yet know what you want. Yeah. He's also talked a lot about this notion of a serendipity engine. He says he wants Google to, to produce things in front of you that you didn't actually realize that you wanted. So uh, in importing a little bit of randomness. But what is interesting about that is how he's thinking about that multimodally. So he's thinking about not, not just from using search, but from using Google Docs and from using the Android platform, which is the mobile phone technology. So he's looking at, at getting more and more information yeah. based upon you know, an even wider breadth. And, and where do you see the problems emerging from there? How do you think that's gonna affect um, you know, what our actual notion of serendipity is and what the technologically driven notion of serendipity is? Yeah. So this is a hot topic given all of this sort of personalization is how do you, uh, you know, manufacture those moments where you feel like you're learning something or you feel like something new is coming up. And I wonder whether at least in the short term that's not sort of fundamentally at odds with what, uh, with the current way that they're thinking about a lot of these tools. So Google really is pretty focused on how do we get the top link to be the link that you most want to click, um, which is just kind of a different problem from, you know, which, which, and the reason they want to do that is so that they can also manufacture that kind of relevance in the ads right next to it. And that maybe actually the link that you click is these ads. They, th these two problems kind of go together. When you're actually trying to provide uh, that sort of sense of discovery, it, it's a different mode. I, I was having this conversation with someone at Google who said, oh, the problem is you're talking about Google as an information mapping tool, and we really think of it as an information extraction engine, which is if you have, uh, you know, sort of a blank in your mind, I'm trying to remember how many people were at the Last Supper or whatever, uh, you know, you can Google it and find out. And, and for that, personalization works really well. But for this more exploratory thing, it's, in a way, it's just not the problem that they're focused on. Um, and I think it may take someone else sort of coming up with some clever ways of, of generating that um, and that feeding back to Google. Who do you think needs to be embedded in technology companies? Who should be involved in the development of, of a technology that allows you to outreach beyond the filter bubble? Peter Thiel, who's uh, one of the big investors in Facebook and uh, developed PayPal and is kind of a fairly major figure in Silicon Valley, um, is, at, is currently running this kind of... Um, it's not a contest, but basically he'll offer people $100,000 to drop out of college and uh, do a startup because he feels like college is a waste of time and why not just go do your startup? And I think that's sort of precisely wrong. Like the problems with Facebook uh, and the way that it thinks about privacy and the way that it thinks about identity come directly from the fact that it's run by someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about engineering and not a lot of time thinking about people. And so we need people who actually can bring that more humanistic perspective to these projects and actually, you know, sort of, if you're gonna do personalization, actually have a clear idea of, of what a person is.